Good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for joining us today. I'm Sharon Jaffe Dan, editor in chief of Home and Design Magazine. If there's one thing I've learned in the many years I've spent in my job, it's the importance of teamwork when building and designing a custom home from the ground up. Since there are countless decisions to be made from day one, it's not only crucial that homeowners hire experienced pros to help them with architecture, interior design, landscape, and construction. It's also critical that these pros collaborate early on in the process to make sure all the moving parts work together seamlessly. The new Spring Valley home we cover in our May-June issue is a testament to this spirit of collaboration. I'm super excited that four members of the design team are joining our panel today to talk about how this incredible residence took shape both inside and out. After graduating from Antioch College and later earning a Master's of Architecture degree from Carnegie Mellon, Christopher Snober worked for a couple of DC firms and then co-founded Hamilton Snober Architects in 1990. In addition to his vibrant residential practice, Chris is committed to work in the community with the Custom Residential Architects Network and ILO, a nonprofit that provides housing for adults with intellectual disabilities. Hello, Chris, and welcome. Hello, Sharon. Here I coming on now. Keep my image. Hi, thank you very much, and thank you for <laughs> welcoming us all to Home and Designs. Of course. Skip Stroka has been creating inspired interiors for Washington area clientele for more than three decades. A graduate of the Cleveland Institute of Art, he launched Stroka Design in 1987. Skip balances a client's personal taste and lifestyle with his vast knowledge of design, art, and history to create interiors that express clients' dreams and allow for gracious living and entertaining. Hello, Skip. Hello, Sharon, and Good thanks for getting you. the band back together. Absolutely. Gavin Stannard is a partner at Zant Singer Inc., where he has been managing construction projects for 22 years. A University of Maryland graduate, he loves solving the unique challenges that residential construction presents, making the architect's vision and the homeowner's dream a reality. Hello, Gavin. Hi, Sharon, thank you for a nice introduction. Okay. Oh, thank you. And a graduate of Ball State University's Landscape Architecture Program, Lindsay Tabor has been immersed in the residential design community in the DC Annapolis area for more than a decade. Her experience with horticultural gardens and park systems informs her work today as a member of the team at Campion Ruby Landscape Architects. Hello, Lindsay. Hi, Sarah. Thanks for having How me. How are you? Of course, welcome. Good to see you all. I'm still here in my dining room. Are you all working at home or in your offices? I think most of us are in home offices. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I'm in my office. <laughs> Skip is in DC. I'm in my is, office. That, mm -hmm. That's great. So we're, we're getting back slowly, slowly. It's hard to believe, Skip, but a year ago, we were working on covering your home in, our, in the magazine. And I'm still grateful. To get crazy. And every, you know, wearing masks and can we do this? And, and we made it happen, but uh, hopefully no, it, it stayed safe. No, that was, that was tough to get a job done, yeah, during, yeah, you know, during really COVID and to do it safely. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. so now hopefully everyone is safe and, and things are slowly getting back to normal. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. And uh, we are covering this beautiful Spring Valley home today, luckily, this project was completed um, before the pandemic hit. And I think the owners were able to entertain a little bit before uh, things kind of shut down. Um, the owners found this fabulous project in, in Spring Valley. Part of what, which attracted them was the site, but it also made it complicated because there's actually a stream that runs through it. So the site actually drove a lot of the, uh, the architecture and of course the landscaping as well. Um, there was a 1930s Tudor on site, but um, it, after a careful study, they decided that um, it would be best to rebuild. So they, they created this um, fabulous home, what in our article Skip called a, a new old home. And this is a, the cover opening spread from our May June story that was written by Catherine Funkhauser. Hi, Catherine, if you're out there. And we have outdoor photography by David Burroughs and all the interiors were shot by Eric Falstick. 
So as we start, uh, I think we'll start with you, Chris, and the architecture. How did you reinterpret Tudor style in this custom home? And how does your selection of materials reinforce the aesthetic? Right, did you want to get the uh, images up on there? We're not, we don't see your, we don't oh, see. I'm so sorry. I thought I shared my screen. Now do you see it? Mm -hmm. Sorry about there that. Go. There we go. Uh, yeah, so this is an image of the back of the house. So yeah, the, the um, as you mentioned, there was, uh, uh, when we started, there was a Tudor house on the site from the 30s. But on top of that, I think one of the attractions of that house originally was that one of the clients actually grew up in a Tudor home uh, in Wesley Heights, not too many blocks away. And that was definitely sort of the way we started. And I think um, the attraction of the Tudor style to them was um, it, it, uh, it had this memory for them, but also Tudor offers this sort of a possibility of sort of an eclectic mix of, of elements. Um, typically, um, uh, as you can see here, this is on the back, but even on the front, the, the, it, it's, everything is asymmetrical. Um, we use elements of different materials like stone and brick and stucco, wood, paneling, timber, mm -hmm. a variety of things, as well as breaking out of the main massing of the building with bays and dormers, um, uh, which are characteristic of the Tudor style. Mm -hmm. it, was, um, it, it sort of a fun, uh, allows for a lot of playfulness, um, which worked well with the client's desires. Absolutely. So as we go through our slides, I want everyone to remember this area because we're going to see it now and you'll, you'll understand where it is. We'll be seeing it shortly, I mean. And here's, here's the front of the house. Exactly. I think, uh, you you sort of freshened up the style, though I would say, from on the interior and, and exterior. Would you would you say, Chris? It, exactly. Yeah. So again, you can see there there there's a balance here, but things aren't exactly symmetrical. They're sort of offset, and then uh, there is in the center of the home uh, the entry, uh, which. Um, uh, has uh, a great deal of, of you know attention to detail here using again an, an element from uh, a typical Tudor architecture uh, heavy heavy timbering we introduced this arch which uh, sort of denotes sort of a warm welcoming place a cozy place at the entry and yet within that sort of arch there's then again more asymmetry the front door and the and the window to the left of it are sort of offset from one another um, but then they share some common elements there's paneling uh, uh, painted wood paneling that is on both the walls and the door. Um, right. And yes, this I love this photo. It, it, it gives such a warm welcome. Throughout our show today, we're also going to be including photos that we didn't have space for in the magazine. So we're, we'll highlight those as well. Here's a before of the landscape, which is absolutely unbelievable, the transformation that took place. And I guess this this is the stream bed here. Mm -hmm. But Lindsay, maybe you can tell us how the landscape plan took shape and what were the major goals of, of your firm's project. Sure, yeah, these photos were taken in 2014, I believe. So um, you can see the stream is hardly visible. It was super overgrown, just hadn't been maintained for a long time. And um, it had good bones, it just didn't have um, a, you know, a sense of purpose and you couldn't really see into the space that you wanted to occupy. Mm -hmm. um, but it's a testament to the owners that they saw the potential that this property had um, and they really had a strong vision for it from the start, which mm -hmm. was great to work from because it, it gives you a lot of inspiration. Um, they they know they knew that they wanted to have spaces for their families, uh, their family members to be there. Um, they have a growing family of grandkids, and they wanted it to be a, a space that was really family oriented. They also wanted to take advantage of um, existing site features like the stream. Um, in this in the left photo, there's actually a retaining wall that's about six feet high that you can't you can't see. Um, mm -hmm. But that was sort of unearthed and we wanted to maintain that and also extend it in a way um, and expand that space. Mm -hmm. 
They wanted There's to- There's a patio. I remember our article said that there, you preserved a patio that was on the other side of the stream. Yeah, so on that image, exactly on the right side is um, an existing terrace that you, it just, mm -hmm. it was so overgrown mm -hmm. that you can see it. Right. So it sort of is like a, a series of, of spaces that were already there, but we just wanted to enhance. Um, mm -hmm. We got the sense from the owners that they wanted to create a sense of oasis, sort of have an interior quality to the garden. Um, and I think we achieved that by, you know, having different zones surrounding the house um, and ultimately have that really, really strong connection to the stream um, mm -hmm. and really beautiful, beautiful views from inside the home to the outside. Right. It, it beautifully blends indoors and out. So is this off of the family room or the living room? This shot. This is uh, this is outside the living room, and the fireplace mm -hmm. there shares uh, a chimney with the living room fireplace that is mm -hmm. on the other side of it. So this is mm -hmm. a large semicircular uh, patio. Uh, in fact, the, the sort of the left wall that you see in the in the left picture is the is the mm -hmm. outside wall of that that patio. Right. And so this is that patio on, that we should, you saw on the first image exactly. exactly. So this goes down to the butt to the, the rear yard. Right. So beautiful. And then this is along the, the rear elevation. And, and what are we looking at here, Lindsay? And maybe you can talk about some of the, the plantings as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this is the rear lawn. Um, the stream is to your left with the bridge that spans it. Um, mm -hmm. That was something that we added. So it kind of had a full route around the property. Mm -hmm. um, but this rear lawn is sort of like that back plinth. So you feel very grounded in that space. Um, you see into the stream, there's a strong connection to the what is technically the basement of the house. And mm -hmm. then um, that boxwood hedge that you're seeing right below it is a retaining wall. And I mentioned there was an existing wall. Mm -hmm. um, and we extended it about 15 or 20 feet toward that column that runs under the deck. Um, mm -hmm. So it's sort of, you know, we took the existing structure and expanded on that and it, it mm -hmm. created this really gracious rear lawn that gets used quite a bit. Mm -hmm. And Gavin, what are we looking at here during this construction sh shot? What sort of phase were you in and what, what challenges did your firm have with building on the site, if any? What, what would you say were the greatest challenges? Well, it looks like we were still framing it then. Um, it was challenging in the backyard because that stream needed to be pr protected. So there was a 25 foot buffer zone from the stream up towards the house and then from the center stream again towards the rear yard. So um, the terrain, so the, the, the site sloped um, pretty dramatically towards that stream. So maintaining our, our sediment controls while we we're building, um, while the soil was raw, um, was a challenge. And that bridge, you, you know, I'm in residential construction, but that bridge has two buttresses. Uh, at each side of that stream, we extended our sediment controls towards the stream with the city's permission, um, dug down and installed two uh, large concrete buttresses that we then um, uh, designed that bridge, had it made out of steel, and used a, a machine to carefully bring it down the hill and set it on the concrete buttresses. It's very interesting, very challenging. Sounds like a challenge, and it's, it's such an incredible feature. It's kind of like creating a destination in the backyard. Yeah, it's pretty terrific. There, there was a, the, the previous owners must have created a loop. There was a path that connected to the back of that bridge that went all the way across that backyard that was kind of mm -hmm. revealed. Do you remember that, Lindsay? Yeah, it felt sort of like there's, if you're looking at this image to your left side, there is an existing stair that kind of goes down to the stream and back up to the rear terrace but it didn't quite complete all the way um, on this side of the house. And so we thought that the bridge spanning it was gonna be much more effective and just a really beautiful moment to be able to see the stream itself. Right, and I'm sure grandkids love the, the fact there's a bridge there. <laughs> it's really great. Tell us, maybe you can tell us a little bit more about the, the planting palette and I love how, how natural it looks, but um, this is one of my favorite outdoor shots. And I think, is this going across the front yard? Yeah, so, you know, if you're at the side terrace, mm -hmm. the sidewalk level is about four feet above 
the, the side terrace level. And so it created this weird effect where people walking on the sidewalk with their dogs um, or running by could see down into the terrace. So we came up with this idea that we could use these box lindens, which are, um, you know, limbed up about five feet, but that that kind of op created a, a sense of openness under the canopy mm -hmm. and then um, had screening where you really needed it against the sidewalk. Mm -hmm. um, it also just really frames um, the symmetry of the front lawn and that that continues down to these boulder steps that kind of wrap the side terrace. Right. Um, and the owners, they, they always wanted it to be sort of a classic elegant garden. Mm -hmm. um, and so we created this sort of sense of garden rooms. There's, there's the front lawn, which is pretty restrained and has a limited palette, but very beautiful. There's the side grove that is um, adjacent to the side terrace, which is a lot of um, birch trees and woodland under, understory plantings. Um, mm -hmm. And then there's the rear lawn and the stream itself. And that is full of um, obviously water loving perennials, ferns, grasses. Mm -hmm. um, that really comes to life, especially um, in the springtime, because there are a bunch of existing azaleas along this stream. So um, in early April, it just is fire pink and white. Right. And it's very dramatic. It must be beautiful right now. So now we are going inside. And I love the warm welcome that this foyer gives. And I think the wallpaper is so special. Skip, what, were, what was your intent here? And maybe tell us how you came about across this wallpaper. Well, the, this is really a sense of arrival. And because of the way that the architecture of the house works, the staircase is coming up and it causes the ceiling to be much lower in this first vestibule that you come into. So we took that opportunity to sort of make it a shimmering gold welcome. But then we toned it down with that William Yeoward table from England and then the you know, that's um, a very practical indoor outdoor sisal that's right, you know, underfoot. Um, but this space allows you to go into three other spaces. So um, that works quite nicely. Love it. And who makes the wallpaper again? Well, the wallpaper was made by Paul Montgomery. Uh -huh. And um, he has a wonderful selection of hand painted papers. And also, he does some vinyls that look very similar to this. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. And now, here's a, a, a view of the living room. This, um, this is a shot that wasn't in our article. I, I just absolutely love it. Maybe you can tell us how the furniture plan came about, Skip, and what, what your goals were as far as. Uh, Finishing it, finishing off the interiors. So in this room, and I think in you know in the magazine, it had the shot of the baby grand. We saw part of the baby grand piano, and like many Tudor houses, this is not a formal room. This is not a perfect rectangle. It actually ends in bay on um, off center on one side, and then the fireplace is not perfectly centered on the other wall, which really makes for a very warm, inviting environment. So there's really two different seating groups here. And this seating group, um, you know, the, the living room is sort of cozy or cocktail is, is the way I describe it, which is the way I would describe a lot of rooms in this house. And so you can come in by yourself and curl up and read a book, or you could have a gigantic cocktail party in here and get both sides of the rooms, you know, to talk to each other. Mm -hmm. Just love it. And I love the palette. Um, and there's a, a wonderful palette in the dining room too, which I guess is kind of like a celadon. Yes, and, it is. Uh, it is a celadon. But first I have to give a shout out to Chris because, you know, this room is so wonderful. You know, it's not your typical dining room. We have that recessed area uh, on the left-hand side of the fireplace, which made a perfect place to put um, a nice um, cabinet over there. And then the, you know, the paneling just gave this room a sense of warmth. And we used Paul Robeson and he fowed everything in different painting techniques so that when you're actually in the room, you get a lot more sense of depth from what you're seeing than when you do from a picture. 
And I also like the restrained, the restrained palette of just a pattern in the carpet and one big pattern on the chairs. I am going to tell a little funny story here on the um, on the owners of the house because when I first met them, they showed me their dining room furniture, and the husband turned to me and said this stays and if you're getting this job you are going to reuse all of our dining room furniture and of course as you can see we reuse their table quite effectively and i love it it's a beautiful beautiful table but the chairs ne never really fit in but what i loved about these clients was in the process of doing this house you know they they very much wanted everything to be perfect and they had a vision for it and they had this great team working with them and they were willing to to shift a little bit in their perspectives in order to get it just right mm -hmm. it's just a beautiful effect gavin maybe you can touch upon the the detailing and, and a lot of the custom mill work that went into the house and uh how, how that worked and what the challenges were inside well, the there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, interior trim, a lot of molding, a lot of custom molding. It's um, in a, the it gets drawn, but the layout of these things is really a challenge. It, it it'll take oh, it'll take a, a couple carpenters a, a day or more just to lay out where the pieces of trim go. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it, it's terrific. And Fred and, and Maureen just wanted the, the best of everything. Um, mm -hmm. They were terrific clients. We, it was a great team. It's a great project. Right. Just beautiful. And here we are in the kitchen. Chris, maybe tell us how the kitchen came about and what your goals were in terms of style and function mm -hmm. in this space, which I love. Well, um, like so many clients we work with these days, the goal of the kitchen, of course, was both to function as a great working kitchen, but also to be a social place so that um, this room is sort of at the intersection of two axes of the house, one of which connects to the, the dining room, another one with the family room that's adjacent to it. And then one line continues right out and maybe Sharon, it, it, maybe it's the next picture that connects out to the, uh, to the breakfast room and beyond to the... Um, to the yard, so that um, th this this room sort of um, it, it becomes sort of a geographical sort of heart of the house where a lot of things can happen. There's a connection to the outside. There's a connection to the formal side of the house. There's a connection to the informal side of the house. And um, uh, the, I mean, the, the kitchen is is so important a room to in, in so many of our projects, but particularly on this one where we and and I think we. Uh, working with Skip and his team to get the layout and the materials and the, um, uh, all the elements uh, put together. It really, uh, really came together nicely. Yeah. And I think like the dining room and the whole house, it's kind of a, a really fresh take on tradition. It's not too fussy. It's very clean. Um, Skip, any comments on, on what you love most about the kitchen? Well, the kitchen really is it's it's a you know once again it's it's a cozy room and it has a great feeling to come into it and i unfortunately in these two pictures we have a, a bank cap that goes against some um, french doors on the other side but it really sort of created a nook you know or sort of like a very nice banquette for the table and chairs and even the table is sort of the the pedestal base of the table is um, just a fun take on tradition. You know, it's very, very sculptural. And we used a quartzite um, on this, which a quartzite is such a strong stone and it doesn't stain. And it really worked quite beautifully. And, you know, this room is actually very neutral. We have the deeper um, floor and then we've got black accents mixed with brass. And it just has a nice welcoming effect. And that's what they wanted. And um, it really turned out quite nicely. On the side where the bank head is, there's mirror doors. Those mirror doors are actually the pantry for the kitchen, but it's just a fun way of disguising a pantry. I did not realize that. Well, I, we do have that image in the magazine, so mm -hmm. people can look at it and online. Mm -hmm. And you, you had a lot of fun in this library, which is painted uh, Benjamin Moore Mallard Green, if I recall. <laughs> Tell us your view on color and what you tell clients when they're open to the idea of using color. 
Well, this is really an intimate room and this is where cozy or cocktail comes right into, you know, the, um, the equation. So the doing lacquered walls like this, even doing them this deep really isn't that deep because it's reflective. And, you know, this room gets great sort of Eastern Southern sun, and it's a great room for um, them to come in and enjoy reading a book. But this is really a cocktail room when they invite another couple over, and they were very specific about that. So the two chairs that you see in the foreground actually came from their old living room and we had them recovered. Um, I designed the rug, which is a high-low pile, uh, you know, for the room to give it sort of a great sense of texture. And what I love about this room is when you're in it and you look through, because you look through the, the, vet, the golden vestibule to get to the dining room, you have this really nice envelope of space and it works very well, but there's still balance because the living room is off of this with double doors and the living room is very white. And we used a lot of these colors in the living room and you can see it working back and forth. There always has to be balance in an interior with you know, doing something deep and rich and wonderful like this. And then you, if you notice all the, the furniture is, is lighter and, and more subdued in order to balance that deep sense of color. Mm -hmm. And Skip, if I remember right, the crown um, protrudes into the room and the ceiling it has a deep coven so it's really dramatic in the evenings when it's uplit. You know you're right Gavin because this portion of the house has higher ceilings than the other part of the first floor and we did do a cove above the built-ins and then actually what you can't see in this picture is there's a grid on the ceiling and inside the grid we used almost like a burlap wallpaper just to give us some really great texture and keep the room cozy. What a great idea. I love the, the ceiling fixture too. Yeah. Really fun. Well, thanks for pointing out the ceiling. That's really cool. And then here's a fabulous, also very cozy media room that um, did not appear in the magazine. And I, I just love this space. And I think it's another interesting use of wallpaper. Skip, tell us about the wallpaper here. Well, the wallpaper is actually a commercial vinyl wallpaper. And I think it's at least an eighth of an inch thick. And it looks like you took a trowel and went into wet plaster and just pulled it straight down. Um, it's not something you wanna run into in the middle of the night, um, but it gives you this incredible texture. And we even covered that door that is between the fireplace and the artwork in it because that's a jib door because there was a storage room off of this, but we didn't really want to see the door there. So we just covered mm -hmm. it in the same wall covering. Right. Well, the, the palette in this room is really fun too. It's, it's just sort of uh, very cocooning. <laughs> has a well, very but, cozy feel. But when you're watching a movie, you don't really want a lot of um, contrast because the mm -hmm. screen is giving off different colors mm -hmm. of light. So mm -hmm. I think you really want to keep rooms where you're going to watch a movie yeah. really neutral so that you can really experience the movie and see the cinematography. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hey, Chris, what Chris, else is the, on this uh, level? Could I point something ahead, out? Sure, and sure. The, the fireplace, I think Chris did, uh, did a, a great job of selecting that. They wanted a fireplace down there, but there really was no place to vent it. So that's a, a an alcohol burning um, fireplace. It really gives off a lot of heat, but requires no venting. Good to know. Yeah. So Chris, so, what else is on the lower level? Right, the, the, these are all the rooms that actually in, in one of the earlier pictures, we saw a series of arches, uh, okay. brick, brick detailed arches in the, in the uh -huh. foundation. And this is one of those. We can go back to that. Uh, buried into the hillside, buried into the house and into the hillside um, rooms. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah, there, there you go. Along here. There. Mm -hmm. And, and um, so that, that actually, so the, the first door you see on the right is actually the media room. And then mm -hmm. there's sort of a, a, a game room and then beyond there's sort of a gym and then mm -hmm. uh, a guest bedroom beyond that as well. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and so these rooms are all sort of nestled in 
um, and you know have a very different feel from the the op more open rooms up above where we had large areas of glass. These, these were all a little more enclosed, and you know, and it's sort of an appropriate place to set you know a media room where you can um, you can sort of gather in the evening, and it's sort of dark and cozy, like in, in, with some of the goals that uh, that Skip had as well. Right. Um, can I just point out one thing since we're back to the back? I just hope that everybody's noticing the way the brick is worked into the stone. It's mm -hmm. really quite clever and it looks mm -hmm. completely as if it evolved over time, but it really gave another layer of sort of depth to this house to have these great details instead of just the walls being stone. Mm -hmm. I agree. And I guess it's, it's sort of a salute to the Tudor style, but in a in a not a super traditional classic way. Yeah. Yeah. Um, right. I just wanted to point out also that so that um, uh, the porch you see beyond that's off the breakfast room in the, in oh, the porch. Uh, and also then provides uh, sort of a link down to that that's the steps down to the uh, to the bridge below. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so much great indoor outdoor living and Lindsay that. So there, are, I remember there are four outdoor rooms or outdoor sort of gathering spaces. Is that correct? So there's our terrace across the bridge, <laughs> the yeah. side patio, and I guess this uh, deck here. Yeah, I mean this this property isn't it really isn't huge, but the the variety of spaces is mm -hmm. really stunning. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the, the stream terrace, the rear lawn, the deck above you see there, yeah. the side terrace, the front lawn, but it's all, it's all like Chris mentioned, kind of nestled into the hillside where mm -hmm. you have almost 20 feet of grade change from the street mm -hmm. level down to the yeah. street. Yeah, that's just incredible. So now we are going to fast forward to the owner's suite. And I love how all the details came together here with all the beautiful textiles, the millwork. Um, Skip, maybe you can talk about sort of the sense of luxury that this room. Uh, well, I think has. when you call this an owner suite, I think how sweet it is. You know, it's <laughs> it's you know, um, you know, Chris and his team did this incredible job with having the ceiling. Um, and having these wonderful beams to work with because it gave us a sense of coziness. And one thing I want to point out is where the chaise lounge is, is actually a bay window that's suspended over the kitchen um, porch. And so when you're sitting in that chaise, you're actually looking straight out over the stream to the other terrace. So it, it really is a great um, source. And we did hidden shades that actually went up into um, the ceiling to give us privacy here. Um, but this room, you know, it's an, it always intrigues me that we were able to do a four poster bed, which really gave you a really cozy place within a cozy place. And yet you've got a great place to have a conversation at night near the fireplace. Um, you know, above the mantle that all opens and there's a TV. So it, it, it really is just a beautiful bedroom. It's a great proportioned bedroom. Mm -hmm. And so part of this post bed is upholstered too. Yes, the bed is upholstered all the way up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Whenever I was on the site, the, the owners described their master suite as the tree house. They always said that it felt because you're so perched you're perched so high that and you're in the tree canopy itself and they just mm -hmm. loved that feeling. Yeah, that's, that's really a great description. And the, the bathroom is also fabulous. Tell us about the, the detailing here, Chris. Or well, you? the bathroom is fitted. Like I, I find that it's, it's luxury, it's big enough to be luxurious. It's small enough to be fitted. One of the things that's hard to tell in, in this shot is that um, each person has a sink, but between the two sinks is a window where the sill hits right the, the, the height. And it, you know, can you imagine the great natural light that goes on your face from there? I mean, it's right. just great. And I love the way the room is paneled and you know, the paneling is worked out to um, just make it once again, give you that great sense of welcome, you know, within right. the space. Right. I just there are many it. elements of this room that, that, that derive from the fact that it, it's tucked in under the roof above the, it's actually above the garage, that window above the tub there is a dormer window that sticks out, that faces towards the street. 
but um, mm -hmm. it, it, I think it's one of the, you know, the fun characteristics of Tudor houses that you get all these quirky spaces that then you have to sort of work within um, and you get, uh, you get spaces with a lot of character and, and delight and little discovered moments. Right. Well, thank you so much. So we're about to open our talk up to questions. Gavin, I wanted to ask you, um, whether related to this house or not, what are some of the um, amenities or features that you have seen that maybe have changed since COVID? And what are, what are people looking for the most in custom homes these days in, in terms of mm -hmm. space or styling or layout that, that you think is, is novel? Well, I, the, um, that, that was one of the first times I did it, but uh, oh, almost everybody is picking out a room that they want to do in a high gloss finish. Mm -hmm. um, not just the millwork, but also the walls and the ceiling. Um, so there's always one of those. Um, home automation, um, lighting control systems, um, sound, um, TV, video. Um, almost every project we do these days can, includes that. Mm -hmm. Including this one, I, am, I, I know. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So things like that. And also an elevator. This, this one has an elevator as well. Mm -hmm. okay. Long-term living. Mm -hmm. Right. It'll add 10, I mean, keep in the house probably 10 more years. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Well, I think we're about ready to open up to questions. I'm going to stop sharing my screen here. And let's see, we have a few questions. Uh, Lindsay, was there a consideration for using local native plantings in the design? Yeah, absolutely. I would say the palette is probably 75% native, if not more, mm -hmm. um, especially because we created the spaces um, you know, around the stream and the birch grove that felt very natural. And so mm -hmm. it made sense to um, you know, enhance them even more with using natives. Makes sense. Uh, another attendee asks, what color paint is used in the owner's baths? It looks greenish, and I thought green wasn't a good color for baths. I, okay, I don't remember what the color is. I don't think the, the bathroom's actually green, though. I think that that may be the computer screen or the way the, the printing is looking, perhaps in the magazine. I recall it to be more of a white. I couldn't tell you exactly what shade it is. It's not a pure white, um, but it's probably more of, of like a winter white. Mm -hmm. Or a soft, very soft gray, pale gray. Very, very, very soft very though, soft. Not, yeah. not too much. I mean, we had a, a beautiful Dolomite marble floor that we did in a herringbone and we were trying mm -hmm. to capture that soft white that was in mm -hmm. the Dolomite. Mm -hmm. Another planting question, Lindsay, what plants are good for hills to hold back erosion? We get this question a lot. Um, on this project, we found that by far the most successful plant is um, Pacara which holds the slope incredibly well, it has a really dense, low growing leaf um, that holds the soil. And it also has a stunning yellow flower at, at about the same time that the azaleas are blooming. So mm -hmm. that this past spring especially was very dramatic. Um, right. Used other things like low growing sumac. Um, the stream has a lot of ferns and carexes and things too, but I think Pacra by far was the most successful. Mm -hmm. I have a compliment from Katie Pope. Such a beautiful home through and through. Love all of the details inside and out. And the feeling is quite serene. So I could not agree more. Thank you, Katie. And here's another question. I know most landscaping takes time to fill in and reach its peak, but this looks great from the start. What's your secret? So I guess it's not it's not brand new when it was photographed or what? It's, it's not. So there, yeah, there really isn't a secret because we planted this in... 2018 I want to say so you know it's been growing in for a couple of years and um, it did quite well even the first growing season but it takes a good three years for the garden to truly grow in right you know if, if I can jump in on that because Lindsay one of the wonderful things that you all did is that because this house is close to the street 
you know, um, some of the rooms look right out to the street and you created and you touched on that with how you had done that with the pathway in front of the house. But when you're in the house, you really feel secluded because you did all those great pleached trees. And those, those really did take off. It didn't take long once they started going. No, no, and we, we selected those um, very purposely at the nursery. So that was mm -hmm. hand selected. Mm -hmm. We located exactly what order they were gonna go in. Um, mm -hmm. I will say the owners, you know, I touched on like how much potential they saw for the property and they knew exactly what they wanted. We actually craned in, you know, 16 foot cryptum areas after the original house was demolished and before the new one was built. So right. they knew exactly what they wanted from the start and, and we just, you know, had to make it happen. Mm -hmm. Well, but Lindsay, it really, you know, whether you're up in the treehouse perch or you're, you know, downstairs, it really doesn't matter where you are in that property. You never fill the neighbors ever. It's fantastic. And they're, they're pretty close in. They're, no, they're, they're very close. Are very close. Yep. Really, really an oasis. Well, I guess I touched upon it in our welcome, but maybe you all can sh reflect on the collaboration and it's clear that the way you all work together, it sort of is a, you know, seamless boundaries between the architecture, the interiors, the landscape and the construction. So maybe you can all just talk about why that worked and, and why it's so important in a project. Got I think it, it worked <laughs> because there were no weak links, everybody, did their job and did it beautifully. And mm -hmm. when the ball got thrown to somebody, everybody, you know, kept working. Gavin, wouldn't you say that was true? That through the whole process, I mean, the clients assembled a team and they know that they needed a team. And I think in the end, the job went better because everybody worked well together, you know, whether it was mm -hmm. Chris's office and my office or, you know, it, it, it just, it, this job really flowed. Yeah, it's great. Beautifully. And, a, and a great client is always the most important part of it. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, we, we, we formed a terrific team. I mean, a lot of support um, going in every direction. Yeah, I mean, the, the client really, um, I think, really made it go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, I think there was a lot of trust. Yeah. Sorry, Chris. No, no, there was no, a lot no, of trust no. on, on all sides, you know. Like Skip said, like you throw the ball and somebody catches it. Um, but it was a, a lot of collaboration and, and um, the owners were very trusting of all of us. Right, I think enthusiastic, confident uh, owners that, that sort of uh, knew how to sort of uh, sort through some good ideas, pick a, pick a good one and run with it and give us, give us uh, the chance to, to do what we could all do best, I think is great. I also always I want to I want to mention a, a, a part of the team that is also we're collaborating with all the way through the project, which is Gavin and his and his builders and all of his subcontractors, like the Masons, um, who who did so much of the of the work there. And then uh, we we did touch on a little bit of it the um, the 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 trim work and the carpentry that all went into this. But I, it's always been one of the greatest aspects of that I've enjoyed about being able to be an architect is the collaboration that I get with with Gavin and all of his workers and coming to the field and and what I get to learn from them it's a, it's a great uh, it's a great experience and it really contributes a lot to to making the project work I, I know true that's true with you Skip too with all the craftsmen that you've brought in on uh, particularly this project had some really really fine fine work done no but I think it was I mean, there was so much good thought. I mean, Gavin, sometimes I felt sorry for your team because I saw the structural being built and that was such a complicated house. And it had all these great spaces, you know, that Chris talks about with the Tudor house and oh, you, you know, you get this great dormer, but you know, almost every room on the second floor has a foot or two coming out. So the structure wasn't setting on a ceiling, it was setting down lower and I remember all those huge beams running through the house and um, you know and, and like everything it gives you an opportunity to then take that space and make it into its own little world its own little piece that that is so comfortable. Mm -hmm. And a really capable painter on that job um, Carlos decorating by Carlos. Mm -hmm. I know because remember I didn't want the 
the high gloss finish hand done. I wanted it sprayed. And he had to show me jobs that he had hand done for me to accept the work before I let him proceed. And because it looks like a man did it. That's right. <laughs> I still remember that. So uh, to make it happen, how, how many meetings did you all have to have? have you schedule or how often did you meet during the design phase? I mean, during the construction phase, I guess everything was already underway, but in the planning stages. I, there were a lot of collaborative meetings. I mean, I, I, we each individually met with the clients developing our individual parts, but there were several. I mean, I remember first meeting with Lindsay and, and uh, Kevin Campion on the site very early on in the process. I remember with Skip uh, as we were developing the kitchen. I mean, they're, they're just, you know, pieces um, that go all the way along. And, and, and actually Zanzinger was an early part of the team because we had done a, a sort of a, a, a first uh, preliminary pricing process. And they, so before the complete set of drawings were done and bid, they were part of the team. And um, that, that also is a very valuable thing, I think, for the clients to get their, their input as we're developing our, mm -hmm. our drawings. I mean, to get, mm -hmm budget input, construction input, and even um, aesthetics and constructability, um, it all works together. But, you know, that's a really good point because some clients tend to hold the different teams in different boxes and they don't let them all out onto the playing field together. And this client definitely understood to put everybody together because there's so much that we worked out early on before we got into construction, you know, cause Sharon, to answer your question there, you know, there were meetings, you know, where Chris needed to work out what was his piece of the architecture. And obviously he had the whole concept for the house done prior to me coming in. And then I came in really to check fit of rooms and could we get everything, you know, sort of fitted into the space. And then Champion Harubi came in as, um, you know, as, as, the, as it was being placed on the lot. And then once we got into construction and once we were under roof and we were really starting the details, I kind of remember being there every two weeks for construction yeah. meetings, you mm -hmm. know, with Chris and Gavin and, you know, and um, Lindsay, you were often there for those meetings too. Mm -hmm. I think at some point it was like every Thursday morning, we were all hands on deck. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, it's, the outcome is absolutely beautiful. So congratulations to you and all of your teams. It really took a small army to, to make this house happen, but it, the results are so beautiful. This was such a treat to have you all together. And, and I learned a lot more from, uh, from talking to you today. And I hope everyone else did too. So thanks to our panelists. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Yeah. Yes, thank you. And all thank of you. Thank you. It was, it was our pleasure and have a great uh, rest of the day and happy spring summer. Indeed. All right, take good care. Thanks again.